Thank you for tuning in to GSM, the Grand Solar Minimum Channel. By now, many of you have seen the most recent presentation by Valentina Zarkova. Valentina's research is a part of the solid foundation that our channel is built from. We invite you to watch our interview with Valentina. We will be following up with her soon about the latest findings and dive into the topic of a super grand solar minimum. We have received several requests where to donate for Valentina's research. We are honored to give you that information right now. Charitable payments can be made to V. Zarkova in care of Halifax Bank. We've included the IBAN and BIC numbers for transferring abroad. All the information that you need to make your charitable donation to Valentina Zarkova is in the details of this video below. Please mark your donations with the words for solar activity research so you can be recognized by the financial Financial authorities. Valentina will soon place these details online. As soon as I receive word where the info is listed, I will also post the links in the details of this video and on the grandsolarminimum.com. Again, thank you for tuning in to GSM. We hope you enjoy this interview with Valentina Zarkova. finally got a chance to talk to you. I know things have been hectic and busy for everybody, so this is, uh, we, we greatly appreciate your time. We really do. Valentina, thank you again. Valentina Zarkova, uh, we are excited to speak with you today. And I guess basically I wanted to ask real quick before we get started a little bit about yourself and your background. Um, what is your primary subject of research? Primary subject of research? Yes. Theoretical astrophysics. Okay. I do plasma physics in the solar flares, in solar prominences. I do particle acceleration and um, precipitation, and so on. So this is my primary, uh, primary research. I'm plasma physicist investigating solar plasma in particular. Okay. So it was, this is why we came to the, uh, in, involving the theoretician, because I wanted to understand as a physicist, what is causing these waves? Right. I can explain very nicely flares and uh, what is produced by them, different emission from the corona to the photosphere and some quakes, but this was absolutely puzzling. So we needed specialists from different fields who can explain us and bring us very nice theory of dynamo machine on the sun. What got you started in this particular kind of research that you do? I am a applied mathematician, does a lot of modeling, and my main topic was um, um, active region particle acceleration, which I was doing most of this, and radiative transfer. But um, in 2002, we got a European project within Framework 5 to do automated pattern recognition of solar features. And um, we done a large catalog for about maybe 10, 14 years. And uh, we got the data set, which we created ourselves of sunspots and the active region and filaments, which made me motivated to use these data sets. Yeah. If we create them um, um, automatically using nice, um, you know, codes and everything and all the methods, uh, we wanted to do some first flavor of utilizing these statistics. So we started doing statistical analysis in 2004, five, and slowly progressed um, from sunspots we discovered the sunspots are not very good proxies describing this activity because detection of them introduces a lot of errors. But when you look at the bigger features, they produce less errors. Or we thought, oh, maybe there is something which can give us better proxy of solar activity. And we thought, all right, there is a magnetic field which measured on the whole solar disk and gives you 1,024 by 1,024 pixels instead of like 
50 pixels on the whole disk. So the accuracy is much better. This is why we decided to look at the magnetic field and given the experience and statistics we gained on the sunspots, eventually we started doing uh, artificial intelligence methods um, with this data because we were doing with uh, catalogs which we developed. So this is how being a um, pure theoretical physicist, I moved slightly towards the statistical uh, physics and uh, this is how we arrived analyzing the magnetic field with the principle of the and so this is how it happened. You work at uh, North Umbria University, correct? And yes. how, how long have you been with them? Uh, four years. Four since years? 2013, yeah. And uh, before I was working for 13 years at Bradford University, so... My research in statistics started from Bradford University, and this is why I still have a collaborator from there. We basically started together, and then we move on. The next thing I was going to go into was your work wasn't received very well with some people in what we would say the global warming community. Um, what was that like at first? I mean, I'm sure that, you know, you weren't thrilled about the, the, the data set that you were coming across. So it, this wasn't like, you know, you were trying to go against the grain. You were just doing your job. Yes, and, uh, my work actually is uh, very well received in other uh, part of, of the research because I published about three papers in Nature. I was the one who discovered sun quakes, and if you trail back, um, 1998 May, you discover that it was coverage in all media about this discovery. Then it was this um, discovery of upcoming Mount the Minimum. And uh, recently, in this June, we published another paper in Nature explaining, returning back to um, solar flares and explaining some particular feature in flares. So okay. uh, I'm doing this in between. And what I've done with the uh, statistical analysis and prediction is like extracurriculum activity. Simply, we discovered interesting effect, and we didn't want to leave it because it was so overwhelming. We right. didn't realize that nobody could see it, and it simply came up to us as a gift. I would say because no one, nobody expected what we got. Um, we done this principal component analysis, which I, uh, curiously enough, teach myself. When I explain them how to solve differential equations, this is we I describe them eigenvalues, eigenvectors. We calculate with them everything. So, and at the same time, when we did our paper in a scientific report, I was teaching my students also uh, the waves. And this was the first time I was teaching the waves to large audience of students about seventy or eighty. And this gave me some links. For what we do, maybe I can find answers in this basic theory of waves. And this is why when we got the results, I was surprised that nobody looked. Everything was in the developed in the wave theory. Yeah. People simply look at it and did notice it. This is what happened. Sometimes we're overlooked, over um, interested in their own theory and not looking at the basics. This is what probably what happened. Valentina. We've been following your work for some time. I have so much respect for you and the research you've done. I'd like to thank you for coming on to the Grand Solar Minimum channel to discuss this research. Your new model promises a 97% accuracy. Your research is exactly what we need to get the people, our viewers, prepared for the future. First off, when you talk about the decrease in the power of the sun and the magnetic fields going 180 degrees out of phase, you state the sun's output power will decrease. Now, are you talking about the decrease as in TSI level or just the magnetic field on the sun that's creating the sunspots? Can you go into that a little bit more for our viewers? I'm speaking only about the magnetic field of the sun. We, we did not calculate any TSI, and even in the previous mountain minimum, the TSI was reduced by 3% only. So obviously, the total solar radiance will not be reduced dramatically, and it was not reduced in the mountain minimum, but something happens with the magnetic field. Magnetic field comes like into hibernation period, but 
it doesn't mean the sun stopped working producing dynamo waves. What simply what we gave very good explanation. The sun is still working very hard as a any like our heart in the human body, but simply what it produces, it produces two waves which interfere with each other and they cause the solar activity over the 400 years. And once per 400 years, these waves suddenly come up into the opposite antiphase. And the standard interference theory of waves show when the waves are in interface, they cancel each other. This is how people work out the noise reduction techniques, right? They, they, they put wave opposite in opposite phase and your noise is reduced and so on. So this is standard thing. It similar happens on the sun. Yeah. Do you think that while those two hemispherical waves are going 180 out of phase, that it creates additional instability around the equatorial region, which may lead to more or larger CME type events? prior to the full cancellation or the two waves coming 180 degrees out of phase? I cannot speculate about it, but normally when the waves, when the magnetic field of the sun is reduced, we see much less sunspots or no sunspot whatsoever. And we predicted in our recent paper that the number of sunspots will be reduced very dramatically by 70% compared to the current cycle, which means if you don't see sunspots, sunspots are places where these um, loops are embedded into the photosphere. It means you don't have these loops. They do not show up on the surface. So there will not be um, active region from which these uh, coronal mass ejections can appear. So theoretically, yes, magnetic field reduced and they can appear. But the problem is, if magnetic field is reduced, it's reduced all over the uh, solar interior, so the much less flux tube appear on the surface. So there's no sunspot. If no sunspot, there's no activity whatsoever. The solar cycle's coming up, you know, with the first predictions of zero sunspots at some point, at solar cycle 26, 27. Uh, and, yeah. th and this is just an obvious question here, but, you know, everybody, there are people that just believe we're going into a minimum. What we see that we are going into a grand solar minimum, then this is not just a solar minimum, but the grand solar minimum. Yes, it will be grand solar minimum because uh, we, we come in now to the minimum between 24th and 25th cycle. Right. You see, there's no sunspots, but still the very enough active region to produce um enough heat waves on the Earth and enough radiance. But the more we come into the cycle 26, will be less and less sunspots. So maybe in five years' time, or five, ten years' time, we can meet if we both wealthy and, and good and discuss that, oh, in July we need to go in court because it's very cold outside. So this would uh, probably will happen um, during this... Um, uh, global minimum, not from normal minimum. Of course, during the normal minimum, the temperature slightly decreases on the Earth. It, it's well known. But this, uh, uh, during the global, it will be much more decreased. And I look at the observations by Lee et al., who restored the temperature during the mountain minimum, which was 400 years ago. Temperature was decreased about one and a half Celsius in the northern hemisphere. Right. And no one knows what was in the southern hemisphere because we didn't have resources there. And even this small decrease caused very long winters and frozen rivers and everything. So maybe we will not have that dramatic decrease, but we still have decrease mm -hmm. global. Valentina, so when you look at the magnetic fields, w many of our viewers are well-versed in the terminology of your research. They understand gales and things of that nature. Could you give a technical description of what's transpiring as to where were we as far as our magnetic field on the sun in gales? Where do you think they will drop to? Uh, at what point do you think we will stop seeing sunspots? And how close to that are we? Um. Say I need to look. You can look at the plots in, in the Nature paper, Nature Scientific Reports paper. But um, magnetic field drops uh, like by 
maybe 10 times compared like to cycle 21 compared to cycle 23 it reduces by factor 4 so it is magnetic field which uh, expands the into the um, solar system and which basically protects the solar system from harming uh, cosmic rays from galaxies and external so probably this will be the main effect on the solar system that we got more external visitors or cosmic rays coming from galaxies and supernovas and somewhere else. But um, the good news is that in 30 years, Sun will return back to normal and restore its power and start protecting us. And given that few, we calculated this um, magnetic field 3,000 years back, and discovered it keep repeating every millennium and people managed to survive the the global warming during the uh, Roman period they had very strong heating and they had a um, more cooling period we managed to calculate it so obviously the planet and humankind as such they survived all these periods simply we and the short lifespan a few 50 years when the science become very powerful and people started publishing everything, everything is available on the internet, suddenly it came to us as a surprise. But this surprise was happening in the few millennia, if not even longer, on the Earth. And it's right. no big surprise for the Earth. How long have you been working on your model and how accurate is it? Uh, the model uh, actually been developed uh, in collaboration with Russian scientist uh, Elena Popova, because what we done um, even uh, we published paper on principal component analysis in 2012, which didn't in include model at all. What we discovered these two ways: we derived them from observations. We derived them from observations, and then in 2014 we derived an um, analytical description of these waves in formulas. We managed to derive them. And when we got those two waves, the analytical description was so amazing that we wanted to understand where the wave comes from. So we invited Elena Popova, who was finishing her PhD in Moscow University, just to look if we can find any dynamo models which explain these particular two waves which we discovered. And very fresh from her PhD, she found that indeed there is a uh, Parker model. Parker is the guy who introduced the dynamo to, to the community. Um, and he applied this model to two layers. He didn't know there are two layers, but he felt probably intuitively that it should be two layers. And uh, Elena modified this model by adding these two layers with different meridional circulation which allows her to obtain the waves with different frequencies or different periods which um, form this beating effect and produce the um, global minima. So thanks to her she used not very complicated model basically a slight of course it is a model con including the uh, induction equation and including equation for transforming poloidal solar field into toroidal through vector potential. So they're all dynamo equations, but they are applied to div two different layers and we used the um, low model approximation. So we didn't use clusters, we used simple computers, low model approximation because our Observations show that we can reproduce these waves with about five or six cosine functions. So it's very close to the approximation of low modes for reproducing Parker models. So we use this uh, the same approximation explaining our... And this gave us a success. We suddenly realized that these principal components which we found are two main waves are indeed produced by dipole magnetic sources exactly as Parker suggested, because now his equations allow to reproduce very nicely these principal component curves, which before they couldn't reproduce because they were polluted with other components which add into to the magnetic field. So this is what happened. And this was a contribution of Elena because she managed to bring the expertise in solar dynamo and gave us explanation 
how these waves could be generated and which parameter could affect how they can come to the beating effect which we observed. Excellent. Valentina, out of the many different theories out there in regards to the universe, can you tell me what theory you and your team follow? I didn't hear this theory. We followed the dynamo theory developed by Eugene Parker from Chicago, very famous scientist, to follow. We followed the classic um, theories explaining the solar activity dynamo. The only thing we, we changed uh, we changed, they introduced the two waves. The one wave generated the bottom of the sun um, near convective zone, and another wave are generated, it generated by the solar interior itself, which acts as a resonator, and the wave generated by solar dynamo travels through this resonator, interfere, interfere with this wave, and produces the visible solar activity which we see as a sunspot. In your paper, you predict the upcoming modern grand minimum, or eddy minimum, in 2020 through 2055, which will have the solar activity slightly higher and its duration twice as short than the maunder minimum of the 17th century. Can you give examples as to how much higher that will be compared to in other minimums yeah. we've encountered? In the... 400 years ago, Maunder minimum, the magnetic field dropped much lower, so the, and the Maunder minimum period lasted for 60 years. So obviously, magnetic field, um, I, I, I don't remember by heart this uh, our diagram, but it was much lower than the current one. We recently simulated the butterfly diagrams for the current um, global minimum compared to the Mount minimum, and we found that we will have more sunspots in the current grand minimum compared to Mount. So it will not be that cold like it was 400 years ago. We will have a little bit more sunspots, but um, to look qualitatively, uh, quantitatively, probably you better look at, at the paper. I wish I can send you the link, and uh, you will see how how much it will be uh, decreased. But we anticipate it will be decreased less than it was 400 years ago because the current grant uh, minimum will last only three solar cycles compared to six solar cycles in the Mount minimum. And the magnitude of magnetic field is reduced um, not as dramatically as uh, 400 years ago. So you in dealing with particle physics. Are you following the work from Jasper Kirkby from the Cloud Project uh, at CERN? about the interaction of cosmic and galactic rays in our atmosphere, increasing cloud nucleation? I followed the work remotely from CERN because I'm not a particle physicist, but I'm familiar with it. Mostly I'm interested and been recently attending IU Symposium as well on the effect of the cosmic rays on the geomagnetic environment and the, in the past years and the so I, I follow this one, yeah. I, I feel it will be important in the next few decades. It will be key player, which is uh, not possibly properly included into the current model predicting the temperature because none of them predicting that the temperature will drop. They say the temperature will increase. Well, we will see in five, ten years who yeah. is right. And it is not far away, so you definitely will be able to judge on your own who is right. And I stand what I said. I'm completely confident what we've done is correct. Yeah, and, and you said it right there. Five to ten years, we're going to see who's right. I think that is uh, accurate. This is not something that we're going to be able to witness overnight. It's not a fly-by-night thing. But we are starting to see the signs that we are heading into this grand solar minimum. We feel like it's also accelerated, not just creeping up, but it's actually accelerated. So, um, yeah, I, I agree with that statement there. I got the um, invitation for interview Al Jazeera before they had this trouble with the other Arab country. <laughs> but what they said, they didn't have snow for the past observation, 150 years, never had snow. And they had snow in April, this yeah. April. And, and it was cold in, in, in the desert, yeah. which not a positive temperature. And they said, they said, definitely, whatever they say, they're respectful of uh, what we suggest much more than any other things, because... 
they see with their own coat, they need to wear a coat. They need to put heat in on in the desert, for God's sake. Last year, <laughs> we covered a story where they were putting long johns on the elephants out there. So, I mean... Yeah. Yeah, this is happening. It's crazy. And whatever, they, in denial, they want to close their eyes. They said it's coming global warming. You have five-day temperature high. I don't know how it is in America, but we had five hot days temperature. Said, oh, it is global warming. But the whole July, we cannot go without jackets. And it is cold. It is 18, 15 degrees in July. And we say, like, we, we should be lucky if we go in the jackets, not in the overcoats. Because in the few years, we will be going over courts. Well, and this is what's happening. We are actually, that's, that's uh, Mari and myself, we live in Buffalo, New York. Most of July, we have worn hoodies or jackets in the evenings. And that's yeah. just not, you know, your skin is cold to the touch. It, the thermometer says 78, but your skin is cold to the touch once you feel that wind blowing. So, absolutely, yeah. we're already seeing that. And yeah, next July, who knows how much worse that's going to be. Yes, this is unfortunate. And what is, uh, people can take clothes and do okay, but what will happen in, the same happen, you know, in Europe, I don't know if they report it in America, we got shortage of gorgets and um, broccoli and, uh, and other nice vegetables because in uh, Portugal and Spain, they had very strong snow and frost in April, and they, they couldn't produce this vegetable. They're frozen out. Wow. So we had shortage in the UK. Okay, they close ice and say, right, this happened once. This will never happen in Spain and Portugal again. But we had shortage of this. And this shortage of food will be repeating because the uh, warm period will be not enough to produce some harvest. And the government should be thinking how to feed the population instead of thinking how to protect them from hypothetical global warming, which probably will be maybe on the equation in 30 years' time when the cooling period goes away. We are 100% agreeable with that statement yes, there. Yes, indeed. We're featuring a place on our website for people to gather and discuss adapting to the changes we'll be facing in the near future. As we go into the decreased magnetic field, of the sun, do you see an increase in the size of coronal holes? Do you think they'll become more prevalent as we get weaker going into this cycle? Uh, it can be. No, no one knows the whole sun is a set of those uh, big flux tube and whatever. So what it means that if you don't have intermediate flux tubes in the uh, on the solar surface. It means that the most of the solar energy will be probably put into these large coronal holes on the north and in the south, which will be probably keeping the sun like in order into the single flux tube or something. This is my intuitive perception. Of course, I did not do the simulation, but now people do observe some increase of size of the coronal holes near poles and so on. So probably this will happen. And again, we will witness this. We, we never, we live very historical time when we can witness right. this grand minimum right away in the sun. They send in a lot of uh, instruments to view the sun. Of course, they wanted to see solar flares and the uh, active region. I said, guys, probably you should stick to your investigation of solar magnetic field because not much of Others, you would see that. Right. This would... <laughs> During this minimum, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Definitely. Now, I've seen yeah. that NASA's Parker Solar Probe mission uh, is due to uh, happen in 2018. Uh, they're saying that this will revolutionize our understanding of the sun. Uh, this probe will provide us some new data on solar activity. Uh, it will study the corona um, have you heard about that mission? Uh, interesting development, and the new instrument called Solar Orbiter will be flying exactly above the North Pole, trying to catch pictures and make observations. So we will be straight in the front row watching the action. Wow. <laughs> this will be luckily visible, So, and then we will have answer. They hope they launch this instrument within the next five years. So obviously, you will have your answer probably right away in the publication by the by the instrument developers. Let's hope. Yeah. 
Well, well, Valentina Zarkova, thank you so much for joining us at the Grand Solar Minimum Channel. It has been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Um, again, we thank you for coming on, spending a little time, and answering a few questions for us. Okay, thank you very much, and good luck. Hopefully, we will get through this. That's right. Uh, that's, that's the hope. We, we're here. Hope. Yeah, we're here to thrive. That's what we're here to try to teach: Absolutely. is how people how to thrive. If Roman managed to to get through, we ma we should manage with all power and technologies. Humankind should get through, become wiser, hopefully during this passing by. But we should get through. Thanks very much. All right. Bye. Take care. Bye bye.